In schools, we all learned that Christopher Columbus discovered America. Of course, that is completely wrong. The Americas were already inhabited for many thousands of years. The Maya, the Aztecs, the Inca and the Mississippians formed the richest and most complex societies in pre-Columbian America. And although distinct, they all shared similar traditions, including religious rituals, spirituality and education. Hi, my name is Sebastian, and today we'll introduce ourselves into the lost civilizations of the New World. Welcome to 7 Facts. The Aztecs and the Incas were conquerors. They waged wars and expanded their empires. However, the Maya were a tad different. They never formed a single empire, nor did they have a single ruler or even a capital. The Maya were sort of a federation of city-states and what united them was their culture, language and religion. Priests were at the top of the hierarchy thanks to their education and their contact with the gods. And precisely because of this, their civilization achieved extraordinary progress in mathematics, astronomy, architecture, engineering and writing. Just like their fellow civilizations, the Mayans had their own pantheon of gods, whose worship and rituals were based on interpreting the cycles of nature. Most of their gods combined a multitude of ideas and shapes. Mayan gods could at the same time be young and old, or could be shaped as animals or humans. The supreme god of the Mayan pantheon was Itzamna, often represented as a wise old man, creator of the world and protector of education and science. And he, like all the other gods, had to be appeased through complex rituals. Mayan ceremonies were often preceded by periods of fasting and abstinence. Food offerings, gifts and dances were offered to the gods and sometimes a human sacrifice was needed. Yes, the Mayans did practice human sacrifice, but not at the scale of their Aztec neighbors. During the ceremony, priests played the roles of the gods and were often high on hallucinogens to increase their power of divination. Well before Columbus, around 800 AD, the Mayan city-states from the lowlands went in decline and in just one century most collapsed. Whether this was caused by natural disasters, disease, climate change, war or political struggle, we don't really know. There are many theories and none can present definitive proof. We do however know for certain that after 900 AD, all the Mayan centers were now only in the northern half of the Yucatan Peninsula. One of those centers is a famous one, Chichen Itza. The city was established around the second half of the 8th century by a group of lowland Mayans together with the local Itza Mayans. Chichen Itza became one of the largest and most important cities of the Maya. They experimented with new rituals, new forms of government and were a vital trading node. But as prosperous as they became in the following centuries, their city also went in decline by 1050 AD, although it wasn't completely abandoned. What is worth noting is the incredible architecture of Chichen Itza and its remarkable similarity with that found in Tula, the capital of the Toltec Empire. The two cities rose to prominence in approximately the same period and strangely fell in decline in the same period. We don't know who influenced who or to what extent they were in contact with each other, but we can assume at least that there were strong cultural and commercial ties between all of the major settlements of central and southern Mexico. Now let's turn our attention to another great power of pre-Columbian America, the Aztecs. Their civilization conquered and ruled over a large number of ethnic groups, but the empire was run by the Mexica people. They were the strongest nation in the Valley of Mexico, maintaining this position from their establishment in the 14th century all the way to the 16th century, when certain pale-skinned visitors from the east began to arrive. The Aztec capital was at Tenochtitlan, a city built in the middle of Texcoco Lake. Today that city is known as Ciudad de México. Back when it was founded in the 14th century, Tenochtitlan was surrounded by swamps and wetlands, hardly the best place to build a city one might say. However, the Aztecs were excellent builders and were particularly good at waterworks. They built dikes and channels to capture fresh water and invented a new technique for agriculture, the chinampas. These were small rectangular areas of very fertile soil, uplifted from the shallow lake beds. 
Basically, they made artificial islands in the middle of the lake to grow their crops. So the Aztecs were great builders and excellent warriors, but what was their society like? Well, first off, the Aztecs were divided into classes, with the nobility being at the top and slaves at the very bottom. Okay, nothing out of the ordinary. What does stand out is their educational system. It seemed to be universal. Both boys and girls benefited from education. Boys, however, also went through military training. The Aztecs were, after all, a nation of warriors. I mean, they didn't conquer and build an empire through diplomacy, that's for sure. This is all well and interesting, but I know what you're waiting for. The one thing the Aztecs are truly famous for. Human sacrifice. Even though the Aztecs had a very rich culture and poetry and music were a central point of their civilization, that's not what they're known for. But why? Like the Mayans, the Aztecs had their own gods, similar in many ways. The gods were the creators of the world, controlled the sun, the harvest, fertility, death and war. The main temples of the Tenochtitlan pyramid were dedicated to Tlaloc and Huitzilopochtli, the gods of rain and fire life and death. Quetzalcoatl, the serpent god of the wind, creativity and fertility, was also a major god of theirs. Okay, so why did the Aztecs practice human sacrifice? Well, this practice was nothing new. Most Mesoamerican cultures offered human lives to the gods in exchange for their goodwill. What stands out in the case of the Aztecs is the way they embedded this practice into everyday life. In their belief system, a great and continuing sacrifice by the gods sustains the universe. So people were in the gods' debt and had to repay that debt with life. Nechtlachwali was a common used metaphor for human sacrifice. It means debt payment. The scale of the sacrifices though is what's truly terrifying. For instance, at the reconsecration of the Great Pyramid of Tenochtitlan in 1487, well, numbers vary, but between 4,000 and 80,000 prisoners were sacrificed over the course of just four days. Between 20,000 to as many as 250,000 people per year were offered to the gods. On average, one in five children of the Mexica subjects were killed annually. The manner of their deaths varied. Some sacrifices were, let's say, humane, others were beyond brutal. For instance, rituals dedicated to the god of fire, Huehueteotl, had the victims numbed, thrown in fire, and just before they died, priests would pull them out in order to cut out their still beating heart. But the ritual for Tezcatlipoca, the god of providence and darkness, was much more pleasant. For this god, the most handsome, brave and fit prisoner had to be chosen because he was to be the reincarnation of Tezcatlipoca. For one year, he was to be pampered and treated almost like royalty and in the last month he would receive four quote-unquote goddesses who would carry out any and all of his wishes. And then he would be sacrificed. It's easy to think that these people were just plain old evil. But you have to remember the context. Human sacrifice was a part of all Mesoamerican cultures. And it's not hard to understand why, once you understand the context. Both Americas lacked large beasts of burden to help plow the fields. There were less species humans could domesticate, the crops they had were not as easy to be cultivated as wheat, for instance and their trade mostly followed a north-south route rather than east-west, meaning longitudes changed along with the climate and plant life, so trade routes were much shorter and harder to cross. So any civilization in the Americas had a much harder time maintaining its society than the rest of the world. It's no wonder that the people living here created much less indulgent gods. So the Aztecs, like other Americans, took all the help they could get. Far away from the world of the Aztecs and the Maya were the Incas. On the western coast of South America, the Incas used both conquest and peaceful assimilations to extend their empire. They had the largest and most powerful state in pre-Columbian America, they called Tawantinsuyo, the realm of the four parts. Their expansion was fast. 
It began in 1438 under Pachacuti, the Sapa Inca or monarch of the Inca. He and his son, Tupac Inca, created an enormous federal state divided into four provinces. In less than a century, they expanded their kingdom into what is today Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, northwest Argentina, parts of Colombia and Chile, about 2 million square kilometers. In each region they incorporated, the Incas built roads that connected it to the capital, Quechua, and the rest of the empire. This was a complex state with a superior way of organization, which is all the more significant since the Incas lacked many of the hallmarks of Eurasian empires. For instance, they didn't invent the wheel yet, they used llamas as beasts of burden. They had no knowledge of iron or steel, had no writing, and their economy had no money or markets, instead using a system of exchange of goods and services that relied on reciprocity between individuals. Taxes were paid in labor obligations, not money. And yet, they created one of the greatest imperial states in human history, full of monumental architecture, an extensive road network, finely woven textiles, agricultural innovations and production in a very difficult environment. Like the Aztecs or the Maya, the Incas too practiced human sacrifice but at a smaller scale. In most cases, human sacrifice was rare, but on some occasions the Incas too went all in. For instance, in 1527, upon the death of Huayna Capac, the third Inca emperor, as many as 4,000 servants, court officials, favorites and concubines were sacrificed. Also, the Incas stand out in this regard due to Capac Hucha, the practice of child sacrifice. These children were a way to appease the gods, who otherwise might cause natural disasters. Upon their deaths, these children became servants of the gods and protectors of the areas where they died. This belief was deeply entrenched into the minds of the Incas and having a child sacrificed was a great honor. For them, the children didn't die, they joined the gods. Unlike their Aztec counterparts, these children were killed in a humane way. They were given alcohol and coca leaves and often were unconscious. These are disturbing practices for sure, but again, remember the context before you judge. Unrelated to this, the Incas were incredibly skilled in stoneworks. Their complex architecture is among their greatest heritage. The stone temples of the Inca used no mortar. Instead, each stone block had to be perfectly cut so that it blended with the next one. An upper stone block was dropped on the one below, then lifted again. The marks left in the dust on the lower block were then carved away and the process would be repeated until the blocks merged perfectly. Because of such attention to details, Inca buildings were incredibly stable. Machu Picchu is a great and one of the last remaining examples of their skills as builders. It's believed this city was built in the 15th century as a royal residence for Pachacuti. Oh, and one more thing I have to mention. As I said, the Incas had no writing, but they did have a way of keeping records. They called it the quipu. It is a weird, unique recording device fashioned from strings that used knots and colors to encode information. While quipus have been around for thousands of years, it's the Incas who used them in the most complex way. With it, they collected data, kept records, monitored taxes, collected census records, used them as calendars and organized their military. Inca historians used quipus to tell Spanish conquistadors their history, but we actually don't know if the strings and knots contained only the dates and numbers or the stories themselves. A much lesser known civilization of pre-Columbian America was the so-called Mississippian culture. They were a civilization that flourished in what is now the Midwest, East and Southeastern United States between 800 and 1600 AD. Although far from the Mesoamerican civilizations, the Mississippians actually had a lot in common with their southern counterparts, including the construction of pyramidal structures. The people of the Mississippi Valley lived in a well-organized society that revolved around agriculture, mainly the cultivation of corn. Some of their settlements are still around, although surprisingly few people know about them. Spiro Mounds in Oklahoma, Moundville in Alabama, 
Etowa Mounds in Georgia are just some examples. But the best example is Cahokia in Illinois, a city built in the 7th century with a population of 30,000 at its peak. These Mississippians raised large pyramid-shaped earth mounds upon which they built homes, temples and burial sites. In Cahokia, 120 such mounds were built that were periodically extended. In the 1200s, the city entered a period of decline and was completely abandoned by the 1400s. By the time Europeans reached North America, the Mississippian culture was already in disarray, probably because of wars, famines and malnutrition, to which the newly introduced diseases brought by the explorers were added and were the last nail in their coffin. The collapse of the culture coincides with the global climate change of the Little Ice Age, so droughts and cold weather, coupled with deforestation and overhunting typically seen around human civilizations, are what led to the dispersal of these people. When Europeans came in contact with the natives of North America, they encountered the descendants of the Mississippians after their society collapsed. In other words, the majority of the American native nations are believed to have descended from this civilization. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. I do hope to see you next time. Bye.